Hi everyone, today we'll be going over accounts, May June 2022, paper 1 1. This is a multiple choice paper which consists of 30 questions, each of one mark, and we are also given a time limit of one hour. Now, without any further delay, let's get started. For the first question, we need to figure out which of the following statements are correct. The very first one is that a book of prime entry is also a part of the double entry system, which is absolutely correct. This is the most basic correct statement, right? So I don't think any explanation is required. The second one is that all sales made by the business are included in the sales ledger. So this is incorrect. Only the credit sales made will be included in the sales ledger. For the third statement, we are given ledger accounts for income and liabilities have credit balances, which is absolutely true. Because if we're talking about income and liabilities, those will have credit balances. But if we are talking about expenses and assets, those accounts will be having debit balances. And the fourth one is that trade discounts appear in the income statement, which is incorrect. So there are two types of discount. The first one is trade and the second one is cash. And we only include cash discounts in our income statement because trade discounts are those discounts given at the time of trade where one party gives up their goods and another party gives up the money. But when we are talking about cash discounts, those appear when there is credit purchases or credit sales made. And those should be included in the income statement. So this is incorrect. Now we have concluded that out of the four statements, only statements one and three are correct, which is given in our option B. That would be the correct answer. Now we can move to the second question. For the second question, we need to figure out which accounting concepts are not reasons for including depreciation in the income statement. And the very first accounting concept we have is matching. So matching concept basically states that we should be matching all of our costs and revenue. And in this case, we are talking about depreciation, which is a non-cash expense. So we will be matching this depreciation against the cost of purchasing the non-current assets on which this depreciation is being applied, which essentially means that matching concept actually reasons for including depreciation in the income statement right now the second concept we have is materiality so materiality concept basically states that material items should be reported properly and we are talking about depreciation which is charged on the non-current assets which could be categorized as material items right which means that materiality concept is also a reason for including depreciation in the income statement the third one we have is prudence and prudence concept states to not overstate our assets and not understate the liabilities. And we are talking about depreciation. So if we do not charge the depreciation to our non-current assets, then we would be stating the non-current assets at their cost rather than the net book value, right? And we obviously know that net book value is lesser than the cost. Now, if we are to record our non-current assets at its cost rather than the net book value, that would mean that we would be overstating our assets in our statement of financial position, which goes against the prudence concept. So this basically means that prudence concept is also a reason for including depreciation in the income statement. And the final one we have is realization concept, which states that revenue should be recognized once it is earned. Now, this does not include depreciation at all, which means that realization concept has nothing to do with including depreciation in the income statement. So realization concept is our correct answer, which is given in option D. All right, now we can move to our third question. On 1st January 2019, a non-current asset was purchased at a cost of 290,000. Delivery and installation costs of 10,000 were also paid. Okay, so in order to figure out the total cost of purchasing a non-current asset or the capital cost, we should be adding all of the one-time costs associated with it. And in this case, we are talking about delivery and installation. All right, let's talk about delivery first. Whenever we purchase any asset, the delivery has to be done only once. It is not something that has to be done very often, right? Which means that we should be categorizing this as our capital expenditure. And so is the case for installation, because once the asset has been installed, it does not have to be installed time and again, which means that this is also a non-recurring expense. So we can categorize this as our capital expenditure as well. So let's figure out the total cost of the non-current assets. That would be 290,000 plus our delivery and installation cost of 10,000. And that results in the total cost of the non-current asset to be 300,000. All right, then the reducing balance method is used to depreciate the assets at the rate of 20% per annum. And a full year's depreciation is charged in the year of acquisition and none in the year of disposal. Now, on 31st December 2021, the non-current asset was sold for 205,000. This is the disposed value and disposal costs of 5,000 were also paid. Now we need to figure out the total profit on disposal. So in order to figure out the profit on disposal, we need to compare the disposed value 
which is 205,000 in this case, to the net book value of this asset at the date of disposal, which is 31st December 2021. And we only have the cost. But we were also given the information regarding depreciation applied, right? Which means that we can easily figure out the accumulated depreciation after which we will be figuring out our net book value. So let's create a timeline because it is easier to visualize the dates at which those non-current assets were in our business. So we purchased it at 1st January 2019. Okay, so this is the year 2019. This is the year 2020. And this is the year 2021. And we can see that the non-current asset was sold at the date of 31st December 2021, which is at the end of this year. And regardless of the date at which the non-current asset was disposed, we were told that no depreciation is to be charged in the year of disposal. So we will not be charging any depreciation for the year 2021, which means that we only need to figure out the depreciation for the year 2019 and 2020. So let's start with the depreciation for 2019. And we are told that the method we are using for charging depreciation is reducing balance, which means that we need to charge our rate of depreciation to the net book value. But in case of 2019, we have recently purchased the non-current asset, which means that there is no accumulated depreciation due to which the cost will act as our net book value. So we can apply the rate of 20% to the cost that we figured out to be 300,000. So that's 300,000 times 20%, which you can write down as 0 0.20, which results in the depreciation for the year 2019 to have the value of 60,000. Now for 2020. So since this is a reducing balance method and we have already figured out the depreciation charge for previous year, in order to figure out the depreciation for this year, last year's depreciation will act as our accumulated depreciation, right? So we need to figure out our net book value. And net book value is just the difference between cost and accumulated depreciation. So that's going to be 300,000 minus our accumulated depreciation, which is the depreciation for last year. That's 60,000. And we just need to multiply it with the rate of 20%. So that's times 0 0.20. Now this gives our depreciation for the year 2020 to be 300,000 minus 60,000 times 0 0.20, which results in the value of 48,000. All right, now we can easily figure out the total accumulated depreciation. That is just the depreciation charges for the year 2019 and 2020, which we just figured out to be 60,000 and 48,000 respectively. Okay, so this gives the accumulated depreciation to be 60,000 plus 48,000, which results in 108,000. We were already given the cost and we just figured out our accumulated depreciation, which means that we can now easily figure out the net book value. And we know that net book value is just the difference between cost and our accumulated depreciation. So we have our cost to be 300,000 minus the accumulated depreciation, which we just figured out to be 108,000. Now this results in the net book value to be 192,000. Okay, and now we need to figure out the profit on disposal. In order to figure this out, we need to compare our net book value with the disposal amount, right? And in this case, the disposal amount is 205,000, but we are also given disposal costs, which should be subtracted as well. So now profit is just going to be the disposed value of 205,000 minus the net book value, which is just figured out to be 192,000 minus the disposal cost, which was given to be 5,000. Now this gives the profit on disposal to be 205,000 minus 192,000 minus 5,000, which is 8,000. And this amount is given in option A, so that will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number four. A sole trader purchased a machine costing 30,000 with an estimated residual value of 5,000 and it was expected to have a useful life of five years. So in these kind of cases where the estimated residual value as well as the expected useful life is given, we can easily figure out the depreciation charge per year. So that's depreciation charge per year. And the formula is cost, which is given to be 30,000 minus residual value, which in this case is 5,000 divided by the number of useful lives, which in this case is five years. And this gives our depreciation charge per year to be 5,000. Then we're told at the end of the fourth year, the machine was sold at a profit of 200, which means that we owned this machine for four years. Then the depreciation is charged using the straight line method. 
Like I said before, we already figured out the depreciation charge each year under the assumption that the depreciation is charged using the straight line method and a full year's depreciation is charged for each year the asset is owned. And since we know that we own the asset for four years, we can now easily figure out the total accumulated depreciation for those four years, right? And we know that the depreciation charge for each year is going to be constant at 5,000. In order to figure out the total accumulated depreciation, we should just be multiplying the depreciation charge per year with the number of years the asset is owned. And that's going to be 5,000 times 4, which gives our total accumulated depreciation to be 20,000. Now we are given the profit and we need to figure out the amount of sale proceeds, which is the disposal value. And in order to figure this out, we require our net book value. Now we can easily figure out the net book value as well because we were given the cost of 30,000 and we already figured out our accumulated depreciation of 20,000. So in this case, net book value is just the cost 30,000 minus accumulated depreciation 20,000, which results in the value of 10,000. All right, and we know the profit, right? So whenever there is a profit, that is just the difference between the sale proceeds and the net book value. And in this case, we have the profit to be 200, which is given in our question. And we need to figure out our sale proceeds. And we also have the net book value, which is 10,000. Okay, so now the sale proceeds is just going to be 200 plus 10,000, which results in the value of 10,200. Okay, and this value is given in our option C. That would be the correct answer. Now we can move towards the fifth question. We need to figure out which statement about control accounts is not correct. So the first one is only cash book entries need to be checked to identify errors. And this is incorrect because errors in prime entry should also be checked because we refer to prime entries when creating the control accounts. Right? So this is not correct, which means that option A would be our answer, but let's go through the remaining options as well. The second one is that the control accounts help to identify where errors have been made. That is in fact true. The third one is that they make the totals of trade receivables and trade payables more easy to obtain. That is true as well, because if we are preparing purchase control accounts, then we would only be recording the credit purchases. And if we are preparing sales control accounts, we would only be recording the credit sales, which means that we would be obtaining the total of trade receivables as well as trade payables from those accounts. Then the fourth one is they reduce the possibility of fraud. That is actually true because the purchase account and the purchase control accounts will be prepared by two different people, which means that they could check each other for any fraud maids. And that could help in reducing the possibility of fraud. And so is the case for sales control accounts and sales accounts, which means that we can conclude the correct option is A. Now we can move toward the sixth question. At the end of the financial period, the trial balance of a business did not agree and a suspense account was opened. The following was then discovered. Okay, I will first read the last part. After adjusting these items, the suspense account was cleared and we need to figure out the opening balance of the suspense account. Okay, now let's go back towards the errors discovered. And in order to figure out the opening balance, I find it easier to figure it out by creating the adjustments for these errors. So I will just be adjusting these errors by preparing a trial balance. So this is the debit side and this is the credit one. Let's go through the first error. A check for 7,800 was correctly entered in the customer's account, but had been debited in the bank account as 7,000. So this just means that a check for 7,800 that customer had provided to us had been correctly entered in their account, but had been debited in the bank account as 7,000 only. But in fact, we should be debiting the amount of 7,800. So in this case, we can say that our bank account is being understated because we only included 7,000 instead of 7,800. So the understated amount is 800, right? And we know that bank account is essentially an asset which would be recorded in the trial balance in the debit side. And since the debit side amount is being understated by 800, I would be correcting it by including this value of 800 in the debit side now, right? So that would be 800. All right, now let's move towards the second error. A credit purchase of 2,500 had been omitted from the books of account. So the key word here is omitted. And we are talking about trial balance. So the thing to remember here is that error of omission is not represented or reflected by our trial balance. So we can completely ignore this error, right? Now we can move towards the third one. 
Discounts received of 9,600 had been entered on the debit side of discounts allowed account. Okay, this is an error on two different accounts. So the very first one we'll be talking about is discounts allowed because we are talking about discounts received, but that amount had been entered in our discounts allowed account. And we know that discounts allowed is an expense, which is related to when discount is given in a sales, right? So in this case, we can say that discounts allowed have been overstated because we recorded the discount received amount in discounts allowed account. And that is the overstatement by the same amount of 9,600. And we know that discounts allowed is an expense and expenses and assets are always recorded on the debit side. So the debit side has been overstated by 9,600. And in order to compensate for this error, we should be recording the same amount on the credit side so that those two amounts cancel each other out, right? So in this case, in order to rectify the error of the overstatement of discounts allowed, we should be recording this amount of 9,600 on the credit side. So that's 9,600. Now let's talk about discounts received because this amount should be recorded under the heading of discounts received, which has not been done yet. So what we can say is that discounts received is actually being understated by the amount of 9,600. And we should be recording this in our trial balance. So discounts received is actually associated with when we make a purchase. So this is essentially an income. And we know that incomes and liabilities are to be recorded on the credit side, right? So this understatement of 9,600 should be also recorded on the credit side. So that's again 9,600. Now we can move towards the fourth error. The sales account had been overcast by 18,200. This just means that the sales account had been overstated by the amount of 18,200. And we know that the sales are recorded on the credit side. But since we have been overstating it in order to compensate for this error, we should be recording the same amount on the debit side so that those two amounts cancel each other out. Right? So that's 18,200 on the debit side. Now we need to figure out which is the heavier side. So let's figure out the total for debit. That's 800 plus 18,200, which is also 19,000. For credit, that's 9,600 plus 9,600, which is also 19,200. So obviously the credit side is the heavier side, right? Which will be the total for both of these sides. And in this case, the balancing figure will be on the debit side. So, and in order to figure out that balancing figure, we need to be subtracting this amount from the total. In this case, that's 19,200 minus 800 minus 18,200, which is also in the value of 200. And remember that I actually rectified these errors in the trial balance and not the suspense account. So, which means that the balancing figure, whatever side it is on, it should be on the opposite side as the opening balance of the suspense account. So in this case, I have the balance of 200. That will be the opening balance, right? But the side will be the opposite side. In this case, I figured it out to be on the debit side, but in reality, the opening balance will be on the credit side. So that's 200 credit. And this amount is given in our option A. That's the correct answer. Now we can move towards the seventh question. For this one, we need to figure out which statements about the bank reconciliation are correct. So the first one is cleared checks are excluded, which is true because those cleared checks amount will be already reflected in our bank balance. So that should not be included in a bank reconciliation. Second one is that it locates all errors. That is not true. The third one is that it locates any fraud. Again, this is not true. And the final one is that uncredited deposits are included. And this is true because uncredited deposits are those deposits that has not yet been included in our bank balance. So if that is not done yet, we should be including this in our bank reconciliation, right? That is why uncredited deposits are included. So out of these four statements, we figured out that the correct ones are one and four, which is given in option B. That will be our correct option. Now we move towards the eighth question. At the beginning of the fiscal year, the inventory was valued at 15,000. During the year, sales of 21,000 and purchases of 18,000 were made. Unfortunately, all inventory was stolen on the last day of financial year. We are also told that goods are marked up by 50% to calculate selling price. And now we need to figure out the cost of stolen inventory. Okay, so we will be utilizing this information. We are told that the goods are marked up by 50%. So this just means that whatever cost of sales there is, we will be increasing it by 50%. So that's times one plus 0 0.50. And this will give our sales value. All right. So let's write down the formula for cost of sales. We will be starting with our opening inventory. Then we will add all of our purchases and subtract the closing inventory. 
and that would give our sales which is valued at 21,000 right here that's 21,000 and I'm going to write this one plus 0 0.50 on the other side which is now a denominator so that's divided by 1.50 okay now let's write down the value for our opening inventory we are told that at the beginning of the financial year inventory was valued at 15,000 so this will be the value of our opening inventory that's 15,000 plus purchases purchases were also given to be 18,000 we can write it down and now we will be needing to figure out the value of closing inventory so that's minus closing inventory equals to 21,000 divided by 1.50 which results in 14,000 now we can easily figure out the closing inventory right so that's closing inventory equals to 15,000 plus 18,000 minus 14,000 which results in the value of 19,000 and we were told that all inventory was stolen on the last day of the financial year which is our closing inventory so essentially all of the closing inventories were stolen and the stolen value was 19,000 which is given in our option C that's the correct answer now we move towards question 9 we need to figure out what will be used to calculate the general provision for doubtful debts so the very first one is total trade receivables only we know that we will be subtracting our bad debts as well as provision for specific doubtful debts so this is definitely incorrect the second one is total trade receivables less irrecoverable debts only like i said before we also include the provision for specific doubtful debts which is not included in this option so this is incorrect and the third one is total trade receivables less provision for specific doubtful debts only again this does not include our bad debts so this is incorrect and the final one we have is total trade receivables less irrecoverable debts and provision for specific doubtful debts which is the correct formula to calculate the general provision for doubtful debts so option D is the correct answer. Now we can move towards the 10th question. At 31st December 2021, a business had calculated the draft profit for the year of 57,500. It was then discovered that the following adjustments were necessary and now we need to figure out the correct profit for the year. All right, so we can start with our incorrect profit or the draft profit, that's 57,500. Let's look at the first adjustment. Inventory valued at 2400 was damaged. So whenever any inventory is damaged, we should be subtracting this, right? So we should be subtracting the value of 2400. So that's minus 2400. And now had a resale value of 1660. So resale value should be added to the inventory. So that's plus 1660. Now this gives the value of negative 2400 plus 1660, which results in negative 740 okay and we are talking about inventory right so whenever we are trying to figure out the correct profit we will be adding those inventories so we need to add this amount so a positive and negative that results in a negative 740 which just means that we should be subtracting the value of 740 from the draft profit in order to figure out the corrected profit so that's minus 740 now the second adjustment is that rent receivable included 400 prepaid for 2022 and we know that we are trying to figure out the correct profit for the year ended 31st December 2021. So this is not our rent expense for the year 2021. So this amount should not be included while figuring out the profit. So we should be subtracting the 400. Right. And we are talking about rent receivable. So this is essentially an income and incomes are always added in order to figure out the profit. So we should be adding this. A positive and a negative that results in negative 400 which just means that we should be subtracting this 400 from our draft profit in order to figure out the corrected profit so that's minus 400 okay then the third adjustment is that the provision for doubtful debts needed to be increased by 890 and we know that the increments in provision for doubtful debts is always treated as an expense right and expenses are always subtracted in order to figure out the profit so we should be subtracting this 890 from the draft profit so that's minus 890. Okay, so the correct profit for the year would be 57,500 minus 740 minus 400 minus 890, which results in the value of 55,470. And this amount is given in option A. That will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question 11. Closing inventory had been undervalued. Now we need to figure out the effect on the financial statements. Okay. Firstly, we need to figure out the effect on the total current assets. So we know that closing inventory has been undervalued, which means that that is a negative, right? Lesser value is shown rather than the original value. 
and now we need to figure out the effect on the total current assets and whenever we are trying to figure out the current assets we would be adding the closing inventories but we know that the closing inventories are shown at a lesser value so that's a negative right and a negative and a positive is a negative which means that the correct assets have been understated right negative is understated which is given in option c and d now we need to figure out the effect on profit for the year as well so whenever we are trying to figure out profit we actually add the closing inventories but we know that the closing inventories are undervalued so that's a negative right and a negative and a positive again results in a negative which means that the profit is also understated and that is given in option a and d so the correct option for both total current assets as well as profit for the year is given in option d which is the correct answer now we can move toward question 12 a sole trader has provided the following information. So we are given the net assets at 1st January 2021 and 31st December 2021. And remember that net assets is just the difference between the total assets and total liabilities. All right. And if we remember the equation that we use for our statement of financial position correctly, then that is just total assets equals to capital plus total liabilities. So in order to figure out capital, that would just be total assets minus total liabilities, which is the formula for net assets. So these net assets just represent the value of the capital accounts at 1st January 2021 and 31st December 2021. Now, during the year ended 31st December 2021, drawings for the year, cash introduced by owner and motor vehicle introduced by owner is given. Now we need to figure out the trader's profit for the year ended 31st December 2021. So I'm just going to prepare a statement here for our capital account. And we know that the capital accounts recorded in our statement of financial position, we always start with the opening balance for our capital account, right? So the opening balance is given at the date of 1st January 2021, which is 10,000. So that's 10,000. And we know that we always add the profit for the year to the opening balance of the capital account. So I'm just going to add the profit, right? This is the amount that we need to figure out. So this essentially acts as our balancing figure. And we are also given the additional information here, right? So the first one is drawings for the year and drawings are always to be subtracted from the capital account because this obviously reduces the capital balance in the company or the business right so that's minus drawings and we will be subtracting the amount of 3200 so that's 3200 in a negative indicating that this needs to be subtracted then we have the cash introduced by owner so this is essentially additional capital which increases the capital balances so we will be adding the additional capital and that amounts to 6000 and lastly, we have motor vehicle introduced by owner, and that is also an additional capital, but in the form of motor vehicle rather than cash, right? So we should be adding this. That's again additional capital, which is 25,000. And now this gives our closing balance of the capital account, which is the balance at 31st December 2021, which is 24,000. Okay, now we can easily figure out the balancing figure for profit. And whenever we are trying to figure out the balancing figure, we need to subtract all of these amounts from the total. And in this case, that's 24,000 minus 10,000 plus 3,200 because two negatives make up a positive minus 6,000 minus 2,500, which results in our profit to have the value of 8,700. And this amount is given in option B. So that will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 13. What will apply to a partnership where there is no partnership agreement? So the first one is that partners are entitled to interest on the capital they have contributed to the partnership. That is actually incorrect. Partners are entitled to no interest on capital because in case of no partnership agreement, no interest on capital is provided by the partnership. The second one is that partners are not charged interest on their drawings. That is actually true because in case of no partnership agreement, we do not have any fixed interest rate to be charged on the drawings. That is why partners are not charged interest on their drawings. Then the third one is that partners are entitled to salaries. That is incorrect. Since we have no partnership agreement, we do not know what amount to agree on for the partners' salaries. And the fourth one is that partners are not entitled to interest on loans they make to the partnership. That is incorrect because interest on loans is fixed at 5% in case of no partnership agreement. Which means that our correct answer for this question is option B. 
Now we can move towards question number 14. X and Y were in partnership, sharing profits and losses equally. On 1st January, P was admitted into the partnership and he contributed 20,000 cash and 10,000 other assets. The non-current assets were revalued upwards by 12,000 on this date. So this is essentially the profit on revaluation. Any revaluation upwards is the profit on revaluation, whereas any revaluation downwards will act as our loss on revaluation. Then there was no adjustment on goodwill. Profits and losses continued to be shared equally among the three partners, X, Y, and P. Now we need to figure out the balance on P's capital account after all relevant entries had been made. So I am going to create P's capital account right here. This is the debit side. This is the credit side. So P does not have any opening balance because P was just admitted into the partnership and he contributed 20,000 cash. That will obviously increase his balance on the capital account, right? So this will be recorded on the credit side. That's 20,000 and also 10,000 other assets. That would again increase the capital balances. So that should be recorded on credit side as well. Then we were given profit on revaluation. But remember that whenever new partners are admitted into the partnership, the profit on revaluation will be shared among the existing partners, but not the new one, which means that P will not be eligible for this profit on revaluation. So this should not be adjusted in his capital account. And there was no adjustment on goodwill. So goodwill should not be included as well. Then the profits and losses continue to be shared equally. So again, there is no adjustments. Now we can easily figure out the closing balance by figuring out the heavier side, which in this case is obviously the credit one. So that's 20,000 plus 10,000, which is 30,000. That's the total for both sides. Now the closing balance of the capital account will be on the debit side. So that's balance CD. And that is just going to be 30,000 in this case, which means that this is the capital account balance after all the adjustments or relevant entries which is given in option C, that would be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question 15. Daisy, Freddie and Harry, who shared profits equally, had been in partnership for some years and Harry decided to retire. All right, Harry's capital and current accounts had credit balances of 40,000 and 8,000 respectively. This just means that Henry had invested 40,000 as capital in this partnership, whereas partnership now owes 8,000 to Harry. Then the total assets of the partnership had a book value of 98,000 but a realizable value of 116,000. There was no adjustment for goodwill. Okay, we can see that the book value is less than the realizable value which means that there is a profit on realization. So profit on realization will be our realizable value of 116,000 minus the book value which is 98,000. And this results in the value of 18,000. So this is the total profit on realization, which should be shared among the three partners, Daisy, Freddie, and Harry equally because their profit sharing ratio is in equal proportions. Now, which amount did Harry receive from partnership on his retirement? So I'm just going to create uh, Harry's capital account. So this is the debit side. This is the credit side. We know that his capital account balance was of 40,000, which should be recorded on the credit side. And we also know that he now will be receiving 8,000 from the partnership. So this receipt will obviously increase his capital balance. So this amount should be recorded on the credit side as well. That's 8,000. Now we also have profit on realization, which should be shared among Harry. And we need to divide it among three partners equally. So that is just going to be the total profit on realization of 18,000 divided among three partners, which results in the profit on realization for Harry to have the amount of 6,000. And profits obviously increases his capital account balance. So this should be included in the credit side. That's 6,000. Okay, this is everything that needs adjustment. Now we can figure out the total and figure out the amount that Harry will receive from the partnership, which will be the balancing figure on the debit side. Okay, so let's figure out the total for credit. That's 40,000 plus 8,000 plus 6,000, which results in 54,000. And this should be the total for debit side as well. Now we only have one balancing figure on the debit side, which will be equal to the total amount, right? So that's 54,000. This is the amount that Harry should be receiving from partnership on his retirement. And this amount is given in our option D. That will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 16. A company made a bonus issue of one ordinary share for every five ordinary shares held. What is the effect on share capital and reserves and net assets? Okay, so the very first thing to remember is that we're talking about bonus issue, which means that 
bonus issue will be funded from all of the reserves in our business rather than from any outside parties. The key word here is bonus issue. And bonus issue is always funded by the business itself. It is funded by the reserve. So if we remember our statement of changes in equity correctly, whenever we make a bonus issue of shares, that would definitely increase the share capital but decrease the reserves by the same amount, which means that the net total would always be zero, indicating that there will be no changes in share capital and reserves. So that would be option C and D. And we're talking about net assets. So obviously that includes any of the cash inflows and outflows, right? And we're talking about bonus issue, which is funded by the company itself. So we will not be receiving any cash from our shareholders for the bonus issue provided, right? So for net assets as well, there will be no changes, which is given in option B and D. And the correct option for both of these headings are given in option D. That is the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 17. At the end of its first year of trading, a company provided the following information. The first one is dividends paid during the year and at the end of the year, debenture paid during the year and at the end of the year, and director salaries. Now, by how much do these items reduce the profit for the year? Okay, so the first one we have is dividends and dividends is always subtracted after profit for the year, which means that dividends will not affect profit for the year at all. So we can just skip this. The second one is debenture interest and we're talking about interest, which will be recorded in our financial charges section, right? So we should be subtracting those interests. The first one is 4,000. So we should be subtracting 4,000. But remember that we also have accrued interest at the end of the year which just means that this 16,000 is the interest for this particular year, which is yet to be paid. And since this is an expense for this year, this should definitely be reflected in our profit for the year. So we should be adding this to our interest charges. So that's plus 1,600 as well, right? And the next one is director salaries. So director salaries is definitely an office expenses, which should be reducing the profit, right? So we should be just subtracting this amount of 10,800 as well. So that's minus 10,800. Now this results in the total of negative 4,000 plus 1,600 minus 10,800, which results in the value of minus 16,400, which just means that our profit for the year will be reduced by 16,400. And this amount is given in option C. That will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 18. M Limited has the following balances at 1st January 2021. We are given the balances of ordinary share capital, share premium, general reserve and retained earnings. Then during the year ended 31st December 2021, an interim dividend of 0.02 per share was paid and there was a transfer of 20,000 to the general reserve. Okay, so let's adjust these two into our balances for our equity section, right? So the first one is interim dividend and this is given per share. So in order to figure out the total amount of the interim dividend, we just need to multiply this rate to the total number of shares, which is given to be 500,000. Right, so let's figure out the total. That's 500,000 times 0 0.02, which results in the value of 10,000. And this is the dividend, which is paid out from our retained earnings, which definitely will reduce the retained earnings balances, right? So I'm just going to subtract the 10,000 from the retained earnings. Then there was a transfer of 20,000 to the general reserves. So this just means that we will be taking 20,000 from retained earnings and adding those 20,000 to the general reserve. So that's minus 20,000 in the retained earnings section and plus 20,000 in our general reserve. And we are also told that for the year ended 31st December 2021, the company made a profit for the year of 80,000. And profits are always added to the retained earnings, right? So that's plus 80,000. Okay, now we can figure out the total. Now for general reserve, that would be 40,000 plus 20,000, which is 60,000. And for retained earnings, that will be 50,000 minus 10,000 minus 20,000 plus 80,000, which results in 100,000. Okay, and now we need to figure out what is the maximum additional dividend payable per ordinary share for the year ended 31st December 2021. A thing to remember here is that dividend paid can be funded through our general reserve and retained earnings. So we just need to figure out that from the closing balances, for general reserve and retained earnings, what is the maximum dividend payable per ordinary share? So the maximum dividend payable would be the closing balances for general reserve and retained earnings. That's 60,000 plus 100,000, right? So that's 60,000 plus 100,000. 
these are the amount that we can give out as dividend to our shareholders but we need to figure it out per ordinary share which means that we just need to divide this by the total number of shares which is 500,000 and this gives the additional dividend payable per ordinary share to be 60,000 plus 100,000 divided by 500,000 which results in 0 0.32 this is the correct answer and this value is given in option C okay now we can move towards question number 19 we need to figure out which ratios are efficiency ratios okay for efficiency ratios there is a little trick all of the efficiency ratios contains the word turnover so basically we need to figure out which of these four ratios contain the word turnover and for the first one we have expenses to revenue ratio there is no turnover so this is definitely not an efficiency ratio the second one is inventory turnover this includes the word turnover which means that this is an efficiency ratio the third one is non-current asset turnover again there is a word turnover which means that this is an efficiency ratio and the fourth one is return on capital employed there is no turnover which means that this is not an efficiency ratio so the correct one is two and three which is given in option b that is the correct answer now we can move towards question number 20. the following information is available for a limited company we are given the closing inventory increase in inventory from the start of the year Okay, this just means that the closing inventory is 50% higher than the opening inventory. So the opening inventory is increased by 50% in order to figure out the closing inventory, right? And we are already given the value for closing inventory to be 30,000, which means that we can now easily figure out the opening inventory value. We can just bring this to the other side. That would be the denominator. So 30,000 divided by 1.50. So this gives our opening inventory value to be 20,000. All right. Then we have our rate of inventory turnover and the gross profit for the year. And we need to figure out the company's sales revenue for the year. Okay, so we can start with the rate of inventory turnover, right? So rate of inventory turnover is just the cost of goods sold divided by our average inventory. And we already have the values for our opening inventory as well as the closing inventory. So we can easily figure out the average inventory. That is just opening inventory plus closing inventory divided by 2, which in this case is 20,000 plus 30,000 divided by 2, which results in the value of 25,000. Right? And we have our rate of inventory turnover to be 8. We need to figure out the cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. We just figured it out to be 25,000. So now the cost of goods sold is just going to be 8 times 25,000 which results in the value of 200,000. Okay, and we need to figure out the sales. We have the cost of goods sold as well as the gross profit. And we know that sales minus cost of goods sold is the gross profit, right? So sales minus cost of goods sold is 200,000. Just substitute this value. Equals to the gross profit, which is given to be 200,000. Now we can easily figure out the sales value. That should be 200,000 plus 200,000, which results in the value of 400,000. That is the total sales value, which is given in option B. That's the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 21. We need to figure out which item is a direct cost. So the first one is carriage inwards on production materials. So the production materials is absolutely necessary in order to produce a good, which means that production materials is a direct cost. And the carriage inwards just means that the cost incurred while bringing in the production materials, which is also categorized as the direct cost, right? So this is our correct answer. But let's have a look at the given options as well. The second one is cleaning materials for the factory. So this is a cost related to the factory, which means that this is a factory overhead rather than the direct cost. This is incorrect. The third one is factory rent, which is again a factory overhead. So it's not a direct cost. And the last one is wages of the factory manager, which is again related to factory overhead. So this is not a direct cost. So our correct answer is still going to be option A. Now we can move towards question number 22. A business pays its employees dollar two for each unit of X they assemble and 3.20 for each unit of Y. Monthly output is 1800 units of X and 1000 units of Y. The factory supervisor is paid 1000 per month. So we need to figure out the direct labor cost per month. So remember here that direct labor cost means that we should only be including the direct cost and we are also given the factory supervisor, right? And factory supervisor comes under the factory overheads, which is not a direct cost. So we can completely ignore the last sentence 
Now let's figure out the direct labor cost per month for unit X. We require dollar two for each unit and we are given the total number of units to be 1800. So we just need to multiply these two together, right? That's 1800 times two plus we repeat the same process for unit Y. And the cost is 3.20 per unit and we have the total number of units to be 1000 so we just need to multiply these two together that's 1000 times 3.20 now we can easily figure out the direct labor cost per month that's 1800 times 2 plus 1000 times 3.20 which results in 6800 and this value is given in option a that will be the correct answer now we can move towards question number 23 an employee works a 35 hour week and is paid an hourly rate of 24. So for each hour, he is provided the labor cost of 24. And in addition to basic pay, she receives a bonus of 25% of her hourly rate. Okay, so the bonus is 25% of her hourly rate. And we know that the hourly rate is 24. So the bonus is just going to be 24 times 25%, which can be written down as 0 0.25. And this gives the bonus to be $6 per hour. Then this is calculated using time saved against the target units produced. Each unit should take 15 minutes to produce. That is the standard rate. Now, for a 35-hour week, she produced 170 units. Of these, two units were rejected and her total pay was reduced by 2.50 per unit. What were her wages for the week? So we know that the total units produced is 170 and the standard rate would be 15 minutes per each unit. So let's figure out the total time. So for 170 units, she should have taken 15 minutes each, right? So that's 15 minutes. And this gives the total minutes to be 170 times 15, which is also in 2550 minutes. And in order to convert it to hour, we just need to divide it by the total number of minutes in an hour, which is 60. So that's 2,550 divided by 60 hour. And that would result in 42.5 hours. So according to the standard time rate, she should have taken 42.5 hours. But she completed these tasks in 35 hours, right? So let's figure out the time saved. That is just the difference between 42.5 hours and 35 hours, which is 7.5 hours. Okay, now we can figure out the total wages. So she will be receiving the hourly rate of 24 for 35 hours, because that is the total number of hours she worked in a week, right? So that's 35 times $1.24, which is the standard rate. And then she also saved 7.5 hours which means that she will be getting the bonus of dollar six per hour for 7.5 hours right so we should be adding that as well that's 7.5 times the bonus of dollar six but we also know that two units were rejected and her total pay was reduced by 2.50 per unit so that's for two units minus two times 2.50 now this gives the total wages for the week to be 35 times 24 plus 7.5 times 6 minus 2 times 2.50 which results in 880. And this amount is given in the option B. That is the correct answer. Now we can move towards question 24. A manufacturing business uses direct labor hours to calculate its overhead absorption rate. We need to figure out what are the causes for the overabsorption of overhead. So overabsorption occurs when the actual overheads is less than budgeted overheads or the actual production is greater than budgeted production. So we should be looking for these two causes in the given options. So the first one is more labor hours have been used than budgeted. So more labor hours add up to more production, right? Which just means that actual production would be greater than budgeted. That is one of the causes that we are looking for, which means that this first statement is the cause for overabsorption of overhead. The second one is more products have been produced than budgeted. Again, actual production should be greater than budgeted production. This matches as well, which means that the second statement is also the cause for overabsorption of overhead. The third one is more products have been sold than budgeted. So we do not consider the sales factors in order to figure out the overabsorption of overhead. So that is incorrect. And we figured out that the correct statements are one and two, which is given in option B. That will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 25. The following information is provided by a company for a month. We're given the actual direct labor hours worked, 
budgeted direct labor hours, budgeted overhead expenditure, and overheads underabsorbed. We need to figure out what is the amount of actual overhead expenditure. Okay, we can see right here that we are told that the budgets are underabsorbed, right? And underabsorption is given by the difference between the actual overheads and the budgeted overheads, right? So I'm just going to figure out the actual overhead expenditure from this equation. We have our underabsorption to be 12,000. And we need to figure out the actual overheads and we need to subtract the budgeted overheads. But remember that the budgeted overheads amount should be corresponding to the actual direct labor hours worked, which is 4,500 rather than the budgeted direct labor hours of 5,000, right? So in this case, for 5,000 budgeted hours, we figured out our budgeted overhead expenditure to be 80,000. But we now require the budgeted overhead expenditure in correspondence with 4,500 direct labor hours. So I'm just going to use the unitary method. For one direct labor hour, our budgeted overhead expenditure would be 80,000 divided by 5,000, but we require it for 4,500 direct labor hours. So that's 80,000 divided by 5,000 times 4,500, right? And this gives the budgeted overheads that we require to have the value of 72,000. Let's record this in our equation. So that's minus 72,000. Now we can easily figure out the actual overhead expenditure. That is just 12,000 plus 72,000, which results in the value of 84,000. And this amount is given in option D. That will be our correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 26. What is the contribution to sales ratio used to calculate? So the first one is break even point. That is correct because contribution to sales ratio is used in order to calculate break even point in dollars. The second one is overhead absorption rate. That is incorrect. The third one is profit for the period. We definitely do not use contribution to sales ratio, but we will be using sales value and contribution value differently. Right. So this is incorrect as well. And the fourth one is value of inventory. That is incorrect, which means that our correct answer for question 26 is option A. Now we can move towards question number 27. We are given the following information that relates to the first year of operation of a business. And we need to figure out the value of gross profit if the business uses absorption costing to value its inventory. Let's figure out the inventory value per unit under absorption costing. So that's absorption cost per unit. Okay, and in this case, we will be adding all of our direct costs plus the fixed manufacturing overhead and divided by the total production units. Okay, let's calculate it. We have our variable production cost per unit to be dollar four. So the total production cost would be four times the number of units produced, which is given to be 5,000. So that's four times 5,000. Plus, we are also given selling expense, but remember that selling expense is not a direct cost. So we should not be adding this in order to figure out the absorption cost per unit. We will be ignoring this information. And we have the total fixed manufacturing overhead, which is definitely included in the absorption costing, right? So we should be adding the 13,000 as fixed manufacturing overhead. Now we can divide it by the total production units, which is 5,000. Okay, and this gives the cost per unit to be 4 times 5,000 plus 13,000 divided by 5,000, which results in 6.60. Okay, now we can easily figure out the gross profit. I am just going to create a statement. In order to figure out the gross profit, we just subtract the direct cost or cost of sales from our sales value. So I'll be starting with the sales revenue. And in this case, we have the unit selling price to be $1.10, and we know that the number of units sold is 4,000. So the total sales value will be 4,000 times 10, which results in 40,000. Let's record this. Now we just need to subtract our cost of sales. So we will be starting with our opening inventory. But remember that this information relates to the first year of operation, which means that there is no opening inventory. So that's zero. Then we add all of our production and we produce 5,000 units, right? And those units is to be included at the cost of 6.60 per unit. So the total production cost will be 5,000 times 6.60, which results in the value of 33,000. Let's include this. 
Then the final one would be to subtract the closing inventory. So we know that we produced 5,000 units but only sold 4,000 units, which means that 1,000 units still remains with us as our closing inventory. And this is also valued at the cost of 6.60 per unit. So that's times 6.60, which is also in our closing inventory value to be 6,600. Let's include this and we should be subtracting this. Okay. Now we can easily figure out the total cost of sales that is 0 plus 33,000 minus 6,600 which results in 26,400. And since we will be subtracting the cost of sales from the total sales, I'm just going to write it down in a bracket as well. Now we can easily figure out the gross profit. That will be the sales minus cost of sales which in this case is 40,000 minus 26,400 which results in 13,600. And this value is given in option C. That is the correct answer. Now we can move towards question 28. A company makes and sells a single product type which has a selling price of $1.20 per unit. Then the variable costs are 8 per unit. Let's figure out the contribution per unit. That is just the selling price minus variable costs, which is 8. That results in 12. We are then given the total fixed cost to be 7,000 and the company wishes to achieve a target profit of 20,000. We need to figure out how many units should be produced and sold to achieve the target profit. Okay. We know that the contribution per unit times the number of units minus our fixed cost results in our profit, right? And we have our contribution per unit to be 12 times the number of units minus the fixed cost. We are given the total fixed cost to be 7,000. And we are requiring a profit of 20,000. So now we can easily figure out the number of units, right? That would be 20,000 plus 7,000 divided by 12, which is also in our number of units to have the value of 2,250. And this is given in option D. That will be our correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 29. Last year, a company sold 2,000 units and made a contribution of $1.50 per unit. After deducting total fixed costs, the profit was 60,000. This year, the sales volume increased by 10%. Okay, so let's increase it. Previously, it was 2,000. So now it would be 2,000 times 1 since we are increasing it we will be adding the percentage which is 10 percent which we can write down as 0 0.10 that gives the total number of units to be 2200 then the contribution per unit decreased by 5 percent previously it was 50 so now we will be decreasing it so that's times 1 minus 5 percent which you can write down as 0 0.05 this gives the contribution per unit to be 47.5 then the total fixed cost increased by 25 percent previously we are not given the total fixed cost but we are given the profit so let's figure out the fixed cost here that would be the number of units 2000 times contribution per unit of 50 minus fixed cost and this would result in the profit of 60000 right now we can easily figure out the fixed cost that will be 2000 times 50 minus 60000 and this results in the fixed cost to be 40000 and now we will be increasing it by 25%. So that's 40,000 times 1 plus 0 0.25, which results in new fixed cost to be 50,000. And now we need to figure out company's profit for this year. So that is just going to be the sales volume or number of units sold, which is 2,200 times the contribution per unit, which is 47.5 minus the total fixed cost, which is 50,000. And this gives our company's profit to have the value of 54,500. This value is given in option B. That will be the correct answer. Now we can move towards question number 30. Which statement does not apply to budgeting? The first one is that budgets are plans that guide management to achieve strategic objectives. That is very true. The second one is that budgeted outcomes should be compared with actual results so that effective management action can be taken. That is true as well. Because we need to figure out how correct our estimates are and if it is too off we need to be coming up with solutions so that that does not happen in the future as well third one is that budget should be easily achieved so that managers appear to be efficient that is incorrect that would go against the purpose of budgets because budgets should give realistic objectives that should be achieved by the managers and sometimes the managers are able to achieve it and sometimes they are not in that case we should be Revaluating the cost or the efficiency of the managers 
and then decide to come up with solutions that will not let that happen in the future. So option C is incorrect, which means that that will be the correct answer. But let's look at option D as well. Management should communicate and coordinate budgets across all levels of management. That is very true. Otherwise, some workers may not be aware of the budgets of the company, due to which they might not be performing accordingly in order to achieve those targets or strategic objectives. Right. So in this case, option C is our correct answer. And this brings us to the end of this paper. If you found this video useful, make sure you like the video and leave a comment below. And make sure you are subscribed to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you do not miss any of these videos in the future. Thank you.